Okay. Which one is better? Now raise your hand. Who thinks uh, Monolith is the best? No one? Oh, you. Okay, you got three. Uh, who thinks microservices is better? Okay, five. And who thinks serverless is the best? One. The rest of you don't think. No. What, what, what do you do? <laughs> uh, building a mobile app. That's one. Uh, okay, so uh, there is a question mark. What is, what is the next thing? And this is uh, going to be our, our talk. But, but the reason uh, we get different answers is because it depends. Okay? Um, every selection, every technology stack that you choose has its pros and cons. It's not that everything is bad. It just what is your need? So with Monolith, you get better resource utilization, which is the cost. You get uh, 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 latency is great. You get performance because everything runs in process. Okay, fast iterations. Microservices is good for ownership when you, you do org scale. Um, and of course, serverless shines in, in the deployment uh, and scaling um, area, right? So, what happened? Okay, wait. I have a clicker, I'm not touching the computer, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so, uh, so the reason why we have uh, uh, so many uh, architectures is because it, it's, each comes to solve something else. But the problem that we have, let's say, choice of a lot of selections, uh, getting is, is getting worse as, as you scale. And one of the hardest problems in, in, in our industry is complexity. Okay, complexity is killing our software developers because they have so many things that you have to think about when you develop software. And with the cloud, it just, getting more and more complicated, right? And when you come to, to think about what are the things that uh, we consider about choosing the, the stack, the, the right technology that, that we want to, uh, to choose, is we usually do trade-offs. And most of the trade-offs are done with these three pillars. How easy it is to code, how easy it is to deploy, and, and what is the operational complexity, okay? How is it is to run and operate? So, hello. Uh, introduce myself, so I'm Aviran. I'm the VP of engineering uh, for Wix.com. Married with uh, three children, happily. Uh, I have a cat. And the dog. Uh, this is a, a, a separation of, of concerns. They don't get near each other. Uh, this is my first computer, so you can guess how old I am. It's gonna hint. This is a Dragon 64. It has 64 kilobytes of uh, memory. Uh, so this was uh, my first my first computer. I worked in uh, in many companies throughout my career, uh, from startups to huge corporations, and eventually I ended up here. So, uh, at Wix, for those of you, a quick uh, intro to Wix, uh, if you're not already familiar. Uh, of course, Wix is a website builder. We will come back to this slide later in, 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 uh, in the presentation, because it's not just a website builder. Uh, Wix is also a full development platform, okay, where you can develop your own code. You get the serverless for the back end. You get databases. You can write your code on the front end. And everything uh, is, is managed for you. Of course, verticals, e-commerce, stores, uh, blog, events. Everything that you want, you can find on our platform. Wix uh, has uh, about 150 million website builders. 
that use our system, about 7% of the internet website running on our platform. And every month we are visited by about a billion uh, users, human, not bots, human users. And we operate around 4,000 microservices clusters and production, hence the issue that, uh, of, of the topic that uh, we're talking about today uh, in three data centers. We are a distributed company. Uh, we have, these are just the engineering sites in Europe, in Ukraine, Israel, Jewish. Okay, now that we're done with the, with the brief intro, let's get back to our topic, okay? Complexity is killing the software developer, and why, and why is that a problem, okay? Because our responsibility as engineers is to deliver business value. Okay? And successful companies uh, deliver high-quality code fast. And that's our keyword, fast. So if it is complex to develop systems, how can we deliver software fast? So let's look at the three leading uh, uh, architectures for, for building a cloud server uh, service. Okay, so a monolith. You start with the monolith. Monolith is very, is very easy thing to start with, right? It's a single product. Every, everyone has access to the code. You can see it's easy to test. Okay, and if you look at it in our uh, trade-off uh, columns, Okay, uh, it's pretty straightforward, okay? But as you scale up, you start to hit into, into, the, into issues, okay? If you put too many domains in one monolith, you start to get a spaghetti code. How do you deploy and operate and scale? And now if you have a production issue, who's the owner of this service? Everybody owns everything, right? So. In the trade-off, it's easy to start, but as you scale up, you get into, into issues. Now, microservices and serverless are very similar, so we'll treat it as one unit. And when you get to, to this kind of architecture, things are starting to become more complicated, okay? because it's not just your app. Now you starting to think about dependencies, okay? Uh, my service needs other services. It depends on other services. You have network protocol, you have failures that you need to, to consider. And these are just the direct dependencies. If you get to a higher scale, you get it in something like this. You got indirect dependencies, and you got a whole system. If you're some are larger than this, you get to something like this, okay? This is not Battleship Galactica. This is the Wix's uh, microservices map from a few years ago. Uh, it's, we have a few more uh, right now. And it's an issue, right? So with microservices and, 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 and serverless, it's kind of the same, the same issues. Uh, you get complex integrations, okay? Uh, you need to think about backward and forward compatibility, the deployment topology, performance, because now instead of the monolith that everything runs in process, you have network calls, network, long network chains, okay? Uh, that every service that, that on the chain, if it slows, it slows down the whole request. So we have our uh, problem domain mapped. The other complexity is code. Okay, so imagine that you're working in a complex uh, domain uh, like we've seen before. And every complex domain, every big system has its own 
rules, regulations, and, 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 and concerns that you have to, to adhere when you're building a software. So let's look at an example. Okay, this is Dana. Okay, Dana is a new developer. And she has a task. She needs to write a task management software, just one single microservice to add to the Battlestar Galactica. And when she comes to, to write this new service, she goes to her manager and she asks him, okay, what do I need to do in order to write my service? What are the concerns? I know, I mean, task management is simple. Okay, I have the task, I get check filled, task completed or not task completed. So the business logic is, is pretty straightforward. But then her manager said, okay, you need to consider how you do the domain modeling and, of course, design an API. And she said, great, I can do that. But also, you need to consider the authentication and authorization because you don't want other people to look at your task. And she said, yeah, fine, I'll do that. But don't forget input validations and object mapping. And also, of course, you're working in our ecosystem, so you have to expose our APIs via RPC. And don't forget the secrets, because otherwise you will not be able to decrypt. She said, okay, great, let's go ahead. Well, wait, 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 how about uh, data access? And uh, don't forget to send the domain events and error handling. But also the PII, the, the query, the caching, the BI and logging. And don't forget to test your system. And she's, Phew. okay, I will figure it out. Now I can go and write my code. Almost, but do you have the scaffolding and the build and how to do the A-B test and the deployment strategy and then a whole lot of concerns before she even started to write one line of code of business logic which is a simple task management system, right? So it's kind of complicated, so how can we help her? We can teach her, we have best practices, right? So we have a rich framework and we write a great documentation about the framework. She said, great, I will read this documentation. Uh, but also I need to understand how identity management works. So we wrote another document that said, okay, this is the identity management. This is how you uh, uh, authenticate users. It was so good, so we wrote a bunch more document. This is how you send webhook, and this is how you adhere to GDPR. These are all the rules. And of course, uh, this is how you connect to the database, and this is how you send events, and this is the best way to do testing here at Wix. A whole bunch of documents. But wait, there is more. More documents. So we filled document by document by document, and by the time we have all the documentations in place, Dana just got lost. And how can she deliver software fast? It's a problem. Who has documentations? If you have documentations, you're in a good spot. <laughs> they don't have even documentations. Uh, so, what can we do about it? There is a... I know, I think that, that, that uh, you know this person that I'm going to show you right now. Uh, you know, he's a kind of a kinda familiar figure. Uh, let's see what he has to say about it. Oh. here is to eliminate 80% of the code that you have to write for your app. Okay, so he said it better than me. So we embarked on a journey to eliminate 
every unnecessary line of code uh, from the coding experience of, of the developers. So, how can we do that? What did we do? Um, we built a platform, okay? We call this platform Nile, okay? This is not a talk about Nile. Uh, we, can, you, we can speak about that later after, after the talk. But in Nile, we basically took all the documentation, all, all the best practices that we had, and codified it into a platform. It's a highly opinionated platform that, that basically paves the road for you in order for you to develop a microservice very, very fast. How fast? We'll see at the end what happened. Very, very fast. <laughs> Come on. It's the purple screen of death. Okay. Uh, so uh, at Wix we work in Scala and the JVM world, so we uh, are using uh, uh, this platform uh, allows developer to reduce the amount of code by between 50 to 70 percent, okay, which is huge. Uh, just to give you a, a, a rough idea what that means, it means that before Nile, from to write a single microservice from scratch took us that they, they did nothing they just crud okay but with a lot of the concerns about 50% of the concerns because nobody remembers all the things that they need to do uh, it took us about uh, for a good developer it took about 3 weeks and by the time we finished now this was about a 4 year project uh, by the time we finish Nile, it takes about three hours. Okay, so this is the impact of, of a platform that, that codifies a lot of the things. So developers, one, don't have to read. Then second, number two, they don't have to re-implement everything. Okay, because basically everyone is doing everything over and over again. So we just codified it into, into the platform. <coughs> So, we built a platform. Remember, this talk is about platform as a runtime. So, this is the P. Uh, the second thing, it's kind of in parallel. Uh, we said, yeah, we kind of really like the serverless uh, paradigm. So, let's build a serverless platform. So let's, uh, when we we're building a serverless platform, let's look at, uh, at a typical software stack, how your servers are running. So usually you get your, your VM on the cloud, from, you get from AWS, you get a VM. On top of that, you run your containers, okay? And then you start to write your code. Usually you pick one of the microservices framework, right? It can be Spring, can be any generic third-party library that, uh, that allows you to write uh, uh, code fast. And on top of that, you build all your trusted environment framework, your own internal framework. These are all the contracts, okay? This is how I parse HTTP. This is how, this is the headers that I expect in, in every RPC call. This is how I get my secrets, okay? so. You write your own internal framework. Everybody has their own internal frameworks, right? And on top of that, this is what your actual business logic. This is the business value. It's just the orange square on the top. So once we separated those concerns, uh, what you do <coughs> is take those things, and this is every developer is doing that. You build it, you package it, and you ship it, right? This is how you build a microservice. You take all your framework, you compile it, you, and you package it. But what is the thing, the, the, the issue that we have with this paradigm? And this is 
maybe 100% of, 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 of software development is, is uh, working like that. When you run a microservice, about 90% of the code that runs in the microservice is not code that you are writing. Okay, you're writing just the, the small top layer. But all the frameworks, all the, you know, the, the, the Jetty, Netty, HD, whatever, right, the springs, all the frameworks that you use, all the third-party libraries that you use, your own internal framework, this is most of the code that, you, that operates your microservice. It's not the business logic. Now take that and scale it. It means that 90% of your cloud resources are operating code that you don't write. Okay, and that creates several other problems. Okay, like uh, the deployment has a large footprint, right? You, you build every artifact that you deploy is hundreds of, 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 of megabytes, maybe gigabytes. Again, but it's all the framework it's that, that are being built into it, right? The deployment lifecycle of a framework, if you update some library, the lifecycle of that library depends on the lifecycle of the business logic, right? Because everybody builds it together and they deploy. So 4,000 microservices in the case of Wix. Potentially, we have 4,000 versions <laughs> of, of the framework, depending when, when each developer decides to release their own, their own artifact. Right? And now what happens if uh, you got uh, the security breach, like the log4j, everybody familiar with the log4j, right? The incident. How do you update thousands of thousands of microservices? Because the log4j library is one of your core libraries that sits in every single one of your thousands of microservices, right? So. Everybody, it's a cross-company effort. Everybody has to recompile, rebuild GA, and some artifacts, of course, are legacy. They have no owners. Nobody knows how to operate them, right? Everybody has the, this, this kind of problems. It's an issue. And another thing uh, is we invest a lot of efforts in building those frameworks to make the lives of our developers easier, right? But now think about what if I want to add another language? Okay, let's say okay, we work in Scala, let's say I want to add uh, uh, TypeScript. Okay, I need to maintain two frameworks. Okay, if I want to do it in Python, I need to maintain three frameworks. It's a lot of overhead. Keep feature parity, a lot of resources, a lot of teams that now have to build the same thing over and over again in multiple languages. So let's think about a perfect world. What would we like to do? Okay, in a perfect world, we want an easy way to write code, okay, with uh, little wiring, no boilerplate, minimal testing, okay, that it's gonna be easy to deploy, easy to update, Highly scalable at low cost. Okay, so I'm kind of uh, a dreamer. Is it possible? So this is really our journey to make this dream possible. So how can we do that? We saw that there is no perfect solution. Every system has its pros and cons. But if we look at the serverless, microservice, and even a managed platform, uh, and take the best of each stack, maybe we can build something. Okay. So what is this next thing? So this next thing is something that we call platform as a runtime. Okay. And and. What I'm telling you is some parts we've already built, some parts we're going to build that's in the future, and some are being worked on as we speak. So uh, 
we kind of took some of the inspiration from, from actually our product, from Velo, which, as I said, it's a development platform where you basically write your code, and that's it. You click save, and that's it. It runs. So we do a lot of the thing because it was built to make the life of our user very, very easy. Okay? It's highly opinionated. It's very easy. It's a bit limited. But we took this concept, and we tried to apply it to, uh, to professional developers. So let's look at our first version uh, that, that we developed. This was in parallel to Nile, to the platform that we developed. We'd, now we started to think about how can we run this thing as a serverless. So we took Node.js, and we put above it the application framework. And then we build the service integration layer, the data service layer, and on top of that, your business logic. And let's see why, why we choose that as, as our first try. So Node.js is very lightweight. Uh, we can dynamic load, dynamically load code into, into the Node.js server. Okay, and it's very, very easy to learn for developers. The application framework basically contains all the uh, the HTTP header, authorization, authentication, monitoring, BI, all, the, all those concerns. The service integration layer is basically containing all the clients for all the other services. So we re reduce all the, you know, I don't have to do the lookup, I don't have to get the client. It already contains all the integrations to any other service on our platform. And of course, the Kafka integration. And the data service, we did a simple data service which is based on DynamoDB. Now, what we did is we took all those tags, everything except your business logic, wrapped it into a deployable, and deployed it into the cloud. So basically, we have a platform serverless as a service which contains no business logic. Now, where is the business logic, you ask? Now you write. Every developer writes their business logic. This is your code. And what we do is deploy it, which basically dynamic loading your code into the platform. So you get the platform as, as, a, as a runtime dependency instead of build time dependency. Now, what is different between this and, and regular AWS Lambda, you say? This is a trusted environment, which means I trust every single code that goes there. This is my own company. I trust it. So I don't have to keep the, the, the isolation, the strong isolation that I have in, in AWS uh, uh, Lambda. What I can do is I can actually run multiple functions or multiple modules on the same host, okay? on, on the same serverless host because I trust this code. I don't have to protect myself against myself. Okay, and uh, basically what we solved is we don't, ha we don't need to do integrations because the platform already integrates to all the other services. I have much less testing. I can think of a small functions and this is something that we couldn't do with microservices because there is a cost associated because the, the large bundle size and the, the, the minimum uh, uh, resource that I need for each microservice, it's not cost effective to reduce it too much, okay? But here, I paid the 90% the once, and I can think about small, small functions, okay? Deployment is very fast, okay, because the, the packaging, the, the, the payload is, is very small because I don't need to compile the frameworks with it. And of course, I have zero boilerplate. So let's see an example of now, remember Dana? Let's see what now she has to do when, if she would have had to write to add the feature with this infrastructure. So we gave her another task, okay? She needs to retrieve the task detail from the task microservices, okay? And now she needs to retrieve the detail of the person from the contacts, 
about th this task. So this is what one API she needs to add. Okay, and another subtask is every time a task is created, she needs to write an audit log to a database. So she comes to this serverless platform. And this is this is an actual code. Okay, this is actual code that 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 implements these tasks. Okay, so what does she need to do? She imports those two services she depends on, right? That's it, just like you were import a class, she imports the services. She defines her API, she adds another endpoint, okay? She gets the ID as a parameter, the task ID. She calls those two services, okay? She calls the task server, get the task by ID. She calls contacts, get the contacts by <coughs> by the contact ID and returns those two. And that's it. She's done. Now she needs to add a Kafka event, right? So she had two more lines of code and now she has a Kafka listener that writes to the database. Remember, she didn't have any connection string, she didn't define any schema, she didn't do any integration, she just write exactly what we asked her to do. And that's it, we eliminated all the boilerplate because everything was provided to her by the platform. And that's it, she's done. And how fast can she deploy it? In about one to two minutes the code is deployed and running on production. Again, easy deployment, small uh, functions. So, building a, a good platform that takes away your boilerplate will really, really improve your velocity. So we were talking about the P of the platform. Let's talk a little bit about the R in the platform, the runtime. So what can we do with this type of, of an architecture? Okay, a lot of cool things. So watch this. We have two teams, okay? We got the e-com team and the payment team. Each one has their own containers, their own platform. Why this is just one strategy. You can put, pick this strategy to still to give ownership of a service or a bunch of services to a team, right? It's not just like a monolith that everybody is just running with everyone. If this is the, the strategy you want to, to choose, you can give everyone, hey, you have your own containers, you can deploy your own functions in, in your containers. Another thing that uh, we did is Dana doesn't care, okay, look at the, at the e-com or the payments. These are in process, they're not network process, okay? Every function runs in process within its own container. But when Dana wrote the code, she doesn't care, okay? She writes the code once and the platform takes her if you need to invoke it in process or out of process. It can scale, okay? If I want to scale up F4, I can simply deploy it on a different container and the system will know how to make, make the call, either in process or out of process, depending on the load. Another thing that we can do is optimize the call. Okay, let's say F2 and F5 frequently interact with each other. Okay, now it's over the network. If we can identify, just like a JIT compiler that optimizes your code, we can optimize the runtime. It means if we can deploy those two functions each in, in the opposite container, we can reduce the network calls towards in-process calls, okay? So we gain less network, better performance, uh, and more resilience because the chances of in-process call would fail is much lower than a network call uh, would fail. So what did we gain from, from, our, from my task? Deployment size is small, okay? 
We can update the libraries, the frameworks on its own lifecycle. We're not depending on the each service lifecycle to be compiled. The, the framework, the, the platform has its own lifecycle, so we can update it very easily. And again, if we have an urgent security issue, we can just update the containers. We are not bounded by the by the time that each one of, of the teams deployed their own and take their, their own libraries. So great, we're done. Uh, almost. There is one point that is missing. How about adding additional language support? So this is an issue. And let's talk about the final act, about weak single runtime. Again, so this is work in progress. Some of it uh, we're working, some of it is already built, but this is kind of the, 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 the grand vision. So we take everything that we've learned so far, and we build a serverless runtime based on Node.js, but I told you that Nile is JVM, right? It's Scala. So we basically, we build things twice. So it's time to do some trade-offs. Okay, so these are the, this is the trade-off that, that we've done. We have separated those two, and we traded off the in-process uh, calls to a local host call. So what we've done is we've taken you know, the platform, which is the single runtime framework, the service integration, the data services, we wrapped it, and we call that a host. Okay? And we put a thin layer of SDK, which the guess this is actually the business logic that you have to write, interacts with, and it, the SDK just interacts uh, with the host. And this is how it looks like. All the ingress and, and, uh, <coughs> and egress network calls are coming to the host, and the host just parses the request and handles all the, the common uh, concerns and pushes it down to the guest. Now, the guest is based on, on Kubernetes, just as a regular uh, microservice that you would have deployed. Okay? What are the trade-offs? Okay? We trade off the in-process to out-of-process, but we gained the whole Kubernetes ecosystem for deployment, for scaling. Okay? We still gain, uh, we reduce the, the, the overhead okay, of the footprint of the microservices by about 50% before optimizations. And the performance is pretty good. We compared this kind of, of, of uh, strategy to a standard microservice, no special thing, just standard microservice. And we gain, we saw that we only have about two millisecond overhead which with the local host uh, communication. So what can we gain? Now we checked all four points, right? Because we get the cost effectiveness, a lower footprint, a single framework with its own life cycle, multiple language support is easier. It's not free because to add another language, we need to write a new SDK, but it's not the whole framework, so it's much more uh, uh, easy. It's easier to write an SDK, and it's cheaper to write an SDK than just to duplicate your whole uh, framework. So uh, this is where we stand. Okay, so building on top of this technology, we were able to bring business value very, very fast. I remember we reduced from, from th three weeks to three, day, to three hours. Okay. We improved our velocity between 50 to 80% of development time. And we can save about, this is just a rough cal calculation because it's not built yet, it's, we did some math. And we think we can save about 50% of, of our AWS cost 
of our compute cost. Because if we have smaller services, we can have a lot more of them per, per machine. And uh, I think it's a good value. Right? And that's it. So thank you very much.